Let me invite you to turn to Mark chapter 15. We are really close to finishing up the Gospel of Mark, this project that we began on Sundays in January. It's taken us 10 months, and when it's all said, and done, it'll take us a little longer than that to uh, wrap up this Gospel. But as we do so, um, every good story has characters that you can identify with, right? Your, your favorite TV programs, your favorite movies, the favorite fiction that you read, whatever, whatever story you like, the concept is that you would identify with the characters involved, that you would see yourself in the characters that uh, are portrayed in the story. But sometimes we identify with the wrong characters. Let me give you an example. Uh, a movie that I've enjoyed recently was the movie Selma, uh, the great story of the civil rights movement. And I've oftentimes thought because of my own convictions that everyone is created equal in the eyes of God and everyone should have a chance to vote in this country and uh, brokenheartedness over the long standing history of racism that we have. I always pictured myself, if I were alive during that time, marching with Dr. King, arm in arm marching for the civil rights movement. But history would say that most pastors during the day of um, Dr. King's protest and, 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 and um, movement, actually most pastors that believe the Bible was true and honored Jesus, they, they didn't partake in the civil rights movement. Most pastors simply considered it as something that the church wasn't to speak into, it was merely a political issue, and therefore they didn't want to get politically involved. And so even though as I look at the story Selma and I sympathize with Dr. King, and if I was a character in the story, I'd be marching right there with him, Chances are, if I lived during that time and I was a, 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 had a church like North Church, I might not be. You and I can do the same thing with the stories of Jesus. Today, we're going to look at a story in the life of Jesus that we're in some of his darkest moments. Jesus is going to be abused and mistreated before our eyes today as we look at Mark 15. And the, the tendency for you and me, followers of Jesus, is to identify with Jesus today. But Although Jesus is always the, the hero in every story of the Bible, I want you to identify today with the other people in the story. We're going to see other characters interacting with Jesus today. And in those characters' response and reaction to Jesus, we're going to see some common ways that people still treat Jesus today. And I want you to identify with some of those other characters. Sound good? Let's pray and we'll jump into Mark chapter 15 together. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that through him, we can experience forgiveness. Through, through him, we can have new life. Through him, we can be connected to each other as a big family. So thank you for Jesus. I pray for those here today who don't yet know Jesus, that they might meet him in the next few minutes that we have together, that they would understand the good news, the gospel, and that they would trust in Jesus, experience new life. So Father, we give you this time entirely. Help us to understand your word. In Jesus' good name we pray, amen. John, uh, John how about Mark? Let's finish Mark first. Mark 15, verse one. It's tough getting old. Mark 15, verse one. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Give some background. So you understand exactly what's happening, especially if you're, if you're new to this series. Jesus has just been tried in a mockery of a trial in the middle of the night by the religious Supreme Court of Israel. They were known as the Sanhedrin. 70 members of which a chief priest or a high priest presided over. So 71, they've, they've held a trial. Many people came up and falsely accused Jesus during that trial. Witnesses' testimony didn't line up. And Jesus was ultimately condemned to death because of two things. One, he professed to be the Messiah. The Messiah is the character that's prophesied in the Old Testament. That's the first 39 books of the Bible that were completed about 400 years before Jesus walked the earth. The Messiah was one who was going to liberate God's people 
and lead them into the future. And then Jesus took it a step further. Not only did Jesus say he was the Messiah, he claimed to be God in human skin. And so the religious leaders of Israel have condemned him to death for blasphemy. Now they can condemn somebody to death, but they can't execute prisoners. They need the Romans to do that. So the idea is, let's try Jesus in the middle of the night. No one can know he's taken into custody because there could be this mass uprising. Jesus is very popular with the people. Let's take him in the darkness of night. Now that they've condemned him, they are faced with the dilemma. How do they get him to the Romans so the Romans can execute him? So the council regathers together and they decide the Romans aren't going the Romans aren't going to kill Jesus because he claimed to be God. That's not a capital offense. Blasphemy is not under Roman law. So they're going to stick with this idea that Jesus professes to be the king of the Jews and he is leading an insurrection against the Roman Empire. So they bring him to Pilate. Pilate is the Roman prefect. He oversees Palestine. And they accuse him before Pilate of being the king of the Jews. And Pilate directly asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus responds in a way that almost seems snarky. Jesus responds, it's what you say. The idea is, yes, he is the king of the Jews, but not in the way that Pilate understands who the king of the Jews is. So Pilate pleads with him, aren't you going to defend yourself? Again, the innocence of Jesus is obvious, even to Pilate. Pilate says, aren't you going to defend yourself against all these charges? And Jesus is silent. Jesus says nothing. Jesus doesn't defend himself. At this point in our story, Jesus is entirely a man of action and a man of few words. He is resolute on going to the cross and dying there that you and I might be forgiven of sin. Do you in any way today in this story identify with the religious leaders of Israel? That's the first thing I want you to see today. Some people accuse Jesus. Some people accuse Jesus. Perhaps you're accusing Jesus today. In, in this story, people falsely accuse Jesus of all things. But indeed, he's not only the king of the Jews, he is king of kings and lord of lords. He is God in human skin. But people falsely accuse Jesus. People refuse to follow Jesus on the basis of their false accusation. Is that you today? Are you falsely accusing Jesus? My family and I, the reduced family, three daughters are away right now, one daughter's at home. So my youngest daughter, Jillian, me and my wife, Kara, went to Southern Colorado a couple weeks ago for a weekend getaway. And one of the things we always enjoy to do when we go there is go to the Pagosa Hot Springs. You ever spend time there? They have all these amazing spring-fed hot tubs. And it's always fun to see, okay, how hot can I take it I got into one that was 113 degrees. Uh, I'm not saying that's good for you because my legs are still red. I won't show them to you. That would be unpleasant for all of us. But I got burned. But anyway, I'm in one of these hot tubs. I don't know what it is about people that when they get in places like that, they just feel free to converse. And specifically, have you ever noticed if you close your eyes and pretend like you're resting, it's almost like people anticipate you can't hear them either. So they just share things with you. You think, I can hear you just because my eyes are closed. This couple. This couple gets in one of the springs that I'm sitting in and I can't help but eavesdrop and they can't seem to help but talk. And so those two things came together. And it was odd because it was their first date. Ladies, how weird is that? If a guy said, hey, let's go out. Hey, let's go get swimsuits on and sit in hot tubs all day. Like, yeah, you probably had to refuse that date. But anyway, they're on their first date and I'm listening to this conversation go on and it becomes a conversation about faith. And then it becomes very evident that the man is a Christian and the woman is not. And so it comes up in conversation around the subject of Jesus. This man says to the woman, what do you think of him? And the woman says, I can't stand him. I don't believe in him. That was interesting. And the guy says, seeing that the date's probably not going to go any further now, says, why? She says, how can I believe in a God who sends children to the children's hospital. She says to him, have you ever walked the ward of a children's floor in a hospital? And he said, I actually have. And he said, she said, when you see all those hurting kids and you see those sick children, you have to look at a God like Jesus and consider him a child abuser. Wow. 
It's a strong accusation to make against Jesus. It's a false accusation, but it's a strong accusation nonetheless. Some people accuse Jesus. We live in a culture where people know about Jesus. They may not know accurately about him, but people know about Jesus, and most people have opinions about Jesus. Most people assert accusations against Jesus, and many of those accusations are false. Are you accusing Jesus today? The story, believe it or not, gets even darker. Verse six. Now at the feast, he, Pilate, used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. Here's what's going on. The Passover feast is about to happen in Jerusalem. The population of Jerusalem doubles because all the Jewish pilgrims are coming from all over the earth, descending on Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. It was a huge feast. It lasted about eight days. And during this feast, apparently it was the custom of the Roman officials to release a Jewish prisoner. In this case, we find there's a prisoner named Barabbas Barabbas is Aramaic. It simply means son of a father. It's a pretty, pretty uh, generic name. Um, all of us men are sons of some father. And so his name is simply son of the father. And he is, he is incarcerated because he murdered somebody. He was leading an insurrection against Rome. This was very common in Palestine. They hated the Roman rule. And he led an insurrection. He actually murdered someone. So when it comes time for the annual prisoner exchange, one prisoner is released at least, and Pilate, in order to win the favor of the Palestinian people, stands in front of him. They remind him, hey, remember, we get a prisoner back. Pilate sees his opportunity because he knows Jesus is innocent. Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. So Pilate says to them, how about I release to you the king of the Jews? makes sense, doesn't it? Look at what happens next. Verse 11. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And again, Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. How does this happen? You ever ask yourself that question? It's amazing. It's an amazing turn of events. The chief priests go to the masses and they stir them up to clamor for Barabbas' release. And this absolutely confounds Pilate, a government official, because Barabbas is guilty. He's killed someone. Jesus is absolutely innocent. He hasn't done anything. As a matter of fact, Pilate has the presence of mind to realize the only reason Jesus is in front of him is because the religious leaders are jealous of his popularity. So Pilate says, who shall I release? They clamor for Barabbas. And then Pilate is left with, well, what should I do with Jesus? It would seem to me the hope is they'll ask for his release because perhaps Pilate will grant them two prisoners to be set free this Passover. But instead of saying, release Jesus too, they say, crucify him. And Pilate, a man who neither knows nor respects God, says, why? That's unjust. Why should I release Jesus? What has he done? What evil has he done? He too professes, like everyone who's tried Jesus, that he's innocent. And the crowd cries out, crucify him, crucify him. So look at Pilate's motive. He wants to score political points. He wants to satisfy the crowd. So for political reasons, he releases the murderer Barabbas to the crowd and he condemns Jesus to be executed by crucifixion. Then he has Jesus 
scourged. It's a horrible beating. As a matter of fact, many people who were scourged by the Romans didn't even survive the beating. Do you identify today with Pilate? Pilate uses Jesus. It's the second thing I want you to see today. Not only do some people accuse Jesus, some people use Jesus. To Pilate, Jesus was nothing more than a political opportunity. Jesus was nothing more to win the favor of the crowd, to gain more power, to gain more status, to gain more fame, and he absolutely uses Jesus to do just that. You and I know what this is like, right? This is going to happen in about a year from now. We're going to have, and it's starting already, we're going to have candidates claim to be loyal to Jesus who truly don't even know him for the sake of advancing their political cause. It's going to get really old really fast, right? They claim to be loyal to Jesus. They support Jesus. They're elected into office and they don't give Jesus a second thought. People use Jesus. Are you using Jesus today? You might not be presiding over his execution trial, but are you using Jesus? Jesus. Is Jesus to you merely a means to another end? Is Jesus just a way for you to live a better life, to be healthier, to be wealthier, to have more friends, to be a more moral person? Are you using Jesus? On Wednesday night, we do this thing that we really enjoy as pastors. We do a text in questions. And there's always good questions that come through. So we conclude our time after we study the Bible. We conclude our time with who has questions. And last week we talked a little bit about what it means to be single, what it means to be married. And someone sent in this question. It starts out with a proverbial, I have a friend. I always love those questions, right? I have this friend. We don't know who's texting in. But the question goes something like this. I have this friend who's really struggling to worship Jesus because Jesus hasn't brought into her life yet a husband. What should I do to encourage my Christian friend to worship Jesus? And pastors gave great answers. They were encouraging answers. Pastor Daniel was on fire that night. He was, he was, he was just doling out a counseling session right then and there. We all were better people from listening to him. It was amazing. And as I walked away from that, I thought about that question again. I said, you know what? This is a person that's using Jesus. This is a person that's using Jesus in the same way Pilate did. This is a person that says, Jesus, I will worship you so that you provide me the spouse I've always dreamed of. And if you don't provide me that, then I'm going to stop worshiping you. We all do that, don't we? We worship Jesus so that. You fill in the blank. It's unique to you. But if you're worshiping Jesus so that, you're using Jesus. Some people accuse Jesus. Some people use Jesus. The story gets very ugly next. Verse 16. And the soldiers led Jesus away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed, spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. That's hard to read, isn't it? Here's Jesus. God in human form, King of kings, Lord of lords, King of the Jews, on his way to the cross, having already been beaten, probably close to the point of death, is now in the hands of a Roman battalion that absolutely abuses and mistreats him. So they bring Jesus in, and mocking his claim to be King of the Jews, they put a purple robe on him. Purple was reserved for royalty. Roman soldiers wore burgundy cloaks, so probably this was a soldier's cloak that maybe had faded a little bit. So Jesus has a purple cloak put on him, and then they they weave together a crown of thorns. 
Same thing in terms of our Southwest climate, like a mesquite tree or a cactus or something that's really good and they force it upon his head. And they take what would be a scepter, some type of rod, probably heavy, and they begin to beat him with it. And they spit in his face. And then they do the ugliest thing that I think they do. They mock him. They mock him with the same salute they would give Caesar. Hail Caesar! They say to Jesus, Hail Jesus, King of the Jews. And they mock him. And after they've had their fun with Jesus, take the robe off, they put his own clothes back on him, and they proceed to march him out to execute him. It's even hard to envision, isn't it? That God would be treated this way by the people he made. God would be mocked. That Jesus would be ridiculed and abused and disrespected and granted no decency whatsoever. Third thing I want you to see today is this. Some people abuse Jesus. Some people accuse him, some people use him, and some people abuse Jesus. These soldiers are abusing Jesus. And the height of their abuse is mocking him, calling him king and ruler with their mouths, but in their hearts despising him. Jesus said this in Mark chapter seven. Jesus looked at the religious people around him and he says, right was the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah wrote about 700 years before Jesus walked the earth, maybe 800 years. Wrote in the Old Testament. Jesus said, right was the prophet Isaiah when he said about the religious people of his day, this people worships me with their mouths, with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Are you abusing Jesus today? Am I abusing Jesus today? What would it look like? Perhaps it wouldn't look as dramatic as what these soldiers, this battalion is doing to Jesus, but it means mocking the kingship of Jesus. And the way that you and I mock Jesus, the way that you and I abuse Jesus, the way that you and I grieve Jesus, the way that you and I hurt Jesus, is we worship him with our lips, with our ritual, with our external routine, but our hearts are far from him. Is that where you are today? Are you abusing Jesus? A few years ago, I was in a church service. I had a different role at the time. I wasn't preaching and service was going on and I had a lot of responsibility. And I remember during that course of that service being on my cell phone the whole time, checking with other pastors. Are you doing your job? Is this getting taken care of? monitoring things, administering things, making sure that people are being prayed over and really caught up in the whole production of what it entails to put on a worship service. And I remember walking out of that worship service and thinking to myself, I believe I just sung every song that we sang. I definitely went forward and I took communion. I remember listening to a sermon I remember doing things with my mouth, speaking and giving credence to words, but I don't believe I connected with Jesus at all from the heart. It's what the Roman soldiers do to Jesus. Now they're a lot more violent and extreme in dealing with Jesus, but the essence of abusing Jesus is merely giving him lip service, going through the motions in worship. You ever done that? You're just going through the motions, but your heart is detached. You're just about external ritual, but inside your heart is distant from God. That's abuse. Some people accuse Jesus. Some people use Jesus. Some people abuse Jesus. Are you guilty of these things? Now, there's one character in the story that we ran past. Who's that? Barabbas. Let's go back to Barabbas. Because I totally want you to identify with Barabbas today. What was Barabbas thinking? This was his good day, right? 
This was his lucky break because he's guilty. If anyone deserves to die, it's Barabbas. He's actually killed someone. If anyone deserves to be crucified by the Roman government, it's Barabbas. He's an insurrectionist. He's a murderer. He's a cold-blooded killer. He's busted. He has no defense. He's absolutely guilty. What happens to Barabbas? He's set free. He walks. Doesn't have to pay for his crime. Who does? Jesus does. Jesus is innocent. Jesus isn't an insurrection. You can't be guilty of insurrection when you have ultimate authority, right? But Jesus humbles himself. Jesus is absolutely innocent, and yet he dies the death the Barabbas deserved to die. He dies the death of a criminal. He dies the death of a rebel in front of everyone. And here's Barabbas, guilty. If anyone deserves capital punishment, Barabbas does. He walks free, and Jesus dies in his place. Fourth category of people I want you to see today is this. Some people who accuse, use, and abuse Jesus, they go free. That's the good news. That's the good news of the Bible. That you and I are all guilty before God. You and I are all deserving and condemned. We deserve death. We are treasonous. We, we, we are insurrectionists. We've rebelled against God. We deserve execution. And Jesus comes along, God in human skin. He lives the perfect life that you couldn't live, that I couldn't live. And he dies the death that you deserve to die and that I deserve to die. And because of Jesus, guess what? If you trust in him, if you have faith in him, if you believe in him, like Barabbas, although you're guilty, you get to walk. And Jesus dies in your place. Well, that's good news. That's good news. You're free because of Jesus. If you give Jesus your sin, then this amazing thing happens. God, because he's a merciful God, he's a gracious God, he's a kind God, he puts to Jesus what Jesus doesn't deserve. That's your sin. And he gives to you that what you don't deserve. That's the righteousness of Jesus. So when God looks at you, you're innocent because Jesus is innocent. You're righteous because Jesus is righteous. You're loved. You're accepted. Oh, we see in Barabbas the picture of the good news. Do you identify with Barabbas today? I hope so. What do you do with this freedom? What does it look like to be free? You're free. If you're trusting in Jesus today, you're no longer condemned, you're no longer imprisoned. You're no longer in jail. You're no longer on death row. You're free. You're free. How do you use that freedom? Let me show you. Galatians 5, verses 13 through 15. This is a book further along in the New Testament. Listen to this truth. For you were called to freedom, brothers. It can mean sisters too. It's collective. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Do you see that? Freedom doesn't just mean doing anything you want to do now that you've been set free. It means you're actually free to obey God. You're actually free to fulfill the law practically that Jesus fulfilled for you positionally, which means to love your neighbor as yourself. You're free to love. You're free to serve. Are you enjoying your freedom, Christian, today? Who are you loving? Who are you serving? You're free. You're not condemned. Oh, you were guilty. But your guilt went to Jesus and his innocence was transferred to you. And because of that, now you're free to live in love. You're free to serve. What do freed people do? They love and they serve others in the way that they've been loved and served by God through Jesus. That's what they do. You know what image I get? You like Westerns? I love Westerns. What happens in a Western when someone is released from jail? What does that guy do? He comes back to the jail and there's a jailbreak, right? He frees other prisoners. 
Albuquerque needs a jailbreak, doesn't it? So many people here on death row. So many people condemned before God. And God has freed you in Jesus. Oh, that we would love and serve each other, that we would love and serve our city, that now that we are empowered, that we would love and serve our neighbor like ourselves, and then we'd see a radical transformation of a prison break right here in Albuquerque. And I'm speaking spiritually, not literally. Don't confuse those things, all right? <laughs> I can see this mob descending on the prison. That would not be good. Pastor Dave told us to do it. All right. Lock him up. You're free. Your sentence hasn't been commuted. Your sentence has actually been fulfilled by Jesus. You're free. What does it look like for us as freed people to love and serve each other, to love and serve our city in such a way that God works powerfully and he frees and he liberates everyone else who's on death row? Are you enjoying your freedom? Oh, I want you to identify with Barabbas today because you and I are just like him. We're guilty. And the only way that we get to go free is because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. Are you enjoying your freedom? Who are you loving? Who are you serving? Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for grace. Thank you for undeserved love. Thank you for imputed righteousness. That you made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Thank you. Lord, let us live out our freedom in every way. Let us love and serve one another. Grow in us a bigger heart to love and serve a very broken city. And Lord, would you initiate a jailbreak? Would you use us to let other people know, family members, friends, coworkers, colleagues, neighbors who are absolutely condemned sitting on death row today that because of Jesus, they can be released. They can walk away. They can step into this freedom that he's given us. Father, right now I pray through the Holy Spirit that you would give each person in this room specific instruction on who they're to love, who they're to serve, who they are to pray for. Jesus, advance your kingdom in our city, in our neighborhoods, in our homes, in our schools. For you indeed are the king of the Jews and you're much greater than that. You're the king of kings and you're the Lord of lords and we want to pay homage to you in a way that our lips aren't disconnected from our hearts. We worship you, Jesus, for your glory. In your good name we pray. Amen.